Good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we are marching on our way to town meeting 2020. And basically this is an interesting year because for the first time in a long while, we have one district with two races. Uh, when Ashley Hill resigned, we picked up a race for one year in District 3. And then when Glenn Hutchinson decided that he wasn't going to run again, we picked up the second one for a two-year term. Uh, we also have no, in, no one running other than incumbents in District 2, which is Connor Casey, and District 1, which is Donna Bates. Uh, on the school board, we have four candidates for four seats. You get a trend going yeah. here. Uh, and those four candidates are on their own separate shows on ORCA, and all of them are good, good shows. And we have Ann Watson coming in, running against no one. You're seeing the <laughs> yeah. same trend. And Ann comes in and speaks in her state of the city, stating her desire to be mayor again. And then Libby and Bill will be presenting school and city budgets in separate shows. Those are good shows as yeah. well. Uh, tonight, we're in District 3, and we're in one of the two-year terms mm -hmm. where we have a contested seat. The one, yeah. And this is Jay Erickson, who's sitting next to me. And Jay, pleased to meet you. Nice to see you again, Richard. Glad to be talking with you again. It is, is indeed my pleasure as well. Absolutely. District 3. Yes. Where in District 3 do you live? So I live in the, I don't know if it has an official title, but the spur off of downtown. So I live on Liberty Street, right near downtown, so not far from here. So on the, the slender edge of this that, that's on the other side of the river. Exactly, the slender edge, exactly, exactly. Well, talk to me about District 3. It's, it's so unique in its own way, taking away that, that piece on Liberty Street and the piece that, that heads. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it is really diverse, and it, it has, it's diverse geographically, particularly, I think. You know, obviously, so much of District 3 is on the other side of the river, on the south side. Um, you have our, our little sliver, like you said. You know, we've got a, a piece of Berry Street, mm -hmm. and then you, you know, run along the river there, and then up Berlin Street, and the associated um, neighborhood that's up there. It continues around, all the, all the way around the bend to the split, past the Ford dealership, and all the way around, almost to the wayside. Um, Past Sherwood Street in that uh, area. Do you all pick the way up there. some towards uh, uh, National Life? I think. Well, yes, of course. And then, so, so you have that sort of that, that direction, that piece. Then you also have up on off Northfield Street on the way down. If you're headed towards towards Northfield that way, um, and you've got the neighborhood around National Life, and then also on the other side of Northfield Street. And then, you know, the other thing that's that's really interesting about District Three, um, and I think it's easy to forget, is it it also runs out to the interstate. And so it's not residential out there, but we do have um, Dog River Field and the access to the river there. Obviously, that's an important um, field. It's you, you know, used part of the year. You know, a lot of uh, kids sports and softball and the adult sports and rec programs. And then, of course, the access to the Dog River right there, right, right um, uh, just about where it connects with the Winooski River. District 3, when people think District 3, they, they think going up to the hospital. They, they think going yep. up that hill yeah. yep. is, is principally what they think of. Mm -hmm. How do you see District 3, uh, the concerns of the neighbors? How do they view that, that area south of the river? You know, it's a great question. And I think that, I think that there's a sense of neglect um, feeling is it like benign neglect? <clears throat> no, no. I feel like there's a sense that, and, and, I, and I agree with this, that so much of our conversation and discourse locally is around the downtown and this really distinct area. And so what happens is I feel, you know, as so much conversation hap around, happens around that downtown area, outlying areas like, like up Berlin Street, um, even out Northfield Street, you know, they feel like they're not part of it part of the conversation. You know, I, 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 you know, the representatives from District 3 have worked hard to represent their district. And I don't want dis to discount any of that effort, but I do think that bringing that, the com creating a conversation that's broader, that looks out at some of these outlying areas and talking about how they fit in with the overall character and community and development of District 3 is really crucial. Now, seeing District 3 as a neighborhood, when mm -hmm. these things are as scattered as yeah. they are, uh, the highlight point of District 1 is Hubbard Park and the recreation field. Yep. The highlight of District 2 in terms of green space, I suppose, uh, would be 
uh, in front of the college or even Sabin's Pasture. Yeah, sure. District three, people don't see Dog River as, as part of this. That's, it's well, there's no distant. residential air. It's not exactly. residential. It's a, it's a walk. I mean, it's great access with the bike path and with the extension of the bike path. It you know now is easier to get there. But you're right. It's not. It do, it doesn't act as a hub. Certainly, we have these very distinct uh, areas within the district. The park commission has forever talked about how to extend to District three. Yeah. Yep. some sort of green space. Yep. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a great idea. I don't know, because of the, the, the diversity and the, the geographic diversity like we talked about, there, there's not necessarily one spot that will be able to tie it together. Um, but I do think that there's an opportunity to, uh, to provide open space that the city manages within the neighborhoods. Um, particularly up Berlin Street, you've got the Stonewall Meadows area would you explain what end. Stonewall Meadows is? Well, that's the section um, that is towards the top, right near... Over the, by Isabel. Yes, I exactly. Uh, right near the Berlin Line, sort of down, and I guess you would say sort of towards the, the west that direction. Um, and there is, my understanding is there is city-owned property. There's there. eight, eight acres. Eight acres. There you go. I knew, I knew it was There's right in that forest range. In it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but I, but I also understand that there are some uh, questions about the boundaries, and there's some, there's some legal wrangling that's happening around those boundaries. But to me, resolving those boundaries, if possible, or those, those legal wranglings, and looking at creating that as a space for that neighborhood, I think would be a crucial next step for the city. You know, I also think that we need to look, if we're looking in that area, is look down the hill and think about that, the, the, com, um, the, the commercial corridor? Exactly, the corridor and how it sits near the river. I think using the Caledonia Spirits of Bar Hill development, I know it's not in the district, it's on the other side of the river, but using that as an example of looking at that corridor and trying to make, make it more livable and pedestrian friendly, I think would be, would be really important. Well, Montpelier Alive can't really touch that because it's not in their charter of to course. go beyond the core their, downtown. And their funding is but dependent, yeah. Various counselors over the years have spoken of trying to beautify that commercial zone, of trying to bring it a more cohesive view. I believe when the wayfaring signs come that they will point actually to that commercial zone. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that is, I think that's essential. I don't see it as a way to extend the downtown per se. I think we still need to look at it as a separate space. But what I, what I don't like is when you travel you, you travel a quarter mile down the road, half a mile, you feel like you're out of town. You feel like you're in a different type of place. And there's no reason why it can't be different, but the same at the same time. We can, it can have, we can unify it in terms of look and feel. We can try to make it more pedestrian friendly. We can look at long-term commercial development. There's nothing keeping the Montpelier Development Corporation from looking out there. And I know they have been and been involved out there. So I really think sort of, looking at the character of downtown and figuring out ways to translate it. And the Wayfarer signs are a perfect example, but how do we translate that feel so that it, it conveys out to that area as well? Now, you came to Montpelier when? Uh, I came to Montpelier, moved into District 3 in 2011. From, oh. and I'd been in Barrie before then, yeah. So you've been in the area for a while? Absolutely, yeah. What was Montpelier like when you first came to Barrie? You know, and, and you were you were in this area for the first mm -hmm. time. What, what was your feeling on Montpelier? Because I'm going to take you to Montpelier of today. What was the Montpelier yeah. like 10, 15 years ago to you? Well, that's a really interesting question because I think not only looking at Montpelier, but I, I, I look at it through the lens of who I was and who, where I was in my life. And I've got... Um, uh, I moved to Montpelier with my wife and three children. I have three boys. They were, at the time, very young. Our youngest was not even six months old. Um, they're now uh, 14, 11, and 9, and two students at the middle school and, and one still over at Union Elementary. Um, we all live right there. Um, and so to me, it, it, when I was living in Barrie, uh, Montpelier still represented a stronger sense of community to us. It was a place that we came for um, to socialize with our kids particularly. We still had friends in this area. We still did it in Barrie as well. But it, it, 
the, the, the conversations that were happening around the downtown, I think, were a lot different. There was, there there was, was parking. Well, exactly. Parking I mean, the eternal conversation. The eternal okay. conversation. Certainly there was, there was the um, uh, thoughts around committing. You know, the, 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 the groundwork was being developed around the commitment to, to net zero goals. That was just sort of, people were just starting to talk about that, move towards it. There was the biomass plant, right? There was, there was a lot, you know, so a lot of those things were happening. Of course, they were still, they were talking about the transit center back then too, right. weren't they? Um, so that, those are the conversations that I remember now. It, I don't necessarily remember the level of, of, of conversation around um, business development and how to improve the experience of people's experience downtown, whether it was for people who owned businesses or commuted into town or walked into town. So I think that's one of the ways I've seen Now you use the word think. town repeatedly. Is Montpelier a town or a city <laughs> to you? <laughs> well, that's a great question. You know, well, Montpelier is a city and I see it uh, as a city. Technically, of course, it's a city. It, it acts as a town. But I think it sees itself as, itself as a village a lot of times, too. It sees what is the difference between a village and a town? I just think of, Sociologically I think, so, I think in terms of scale. I think in terms of, uh, there is there's such a tight-knit and strong sense of community around here. I think folks feel like they're going to walk, they're going to walk downtown, they're going to head down street, and they're going to know just about everybody they see. That's not always the case, and that's one of the things I love about Montpelier is this, with the size and obviously the number of people who um, who come into town every day to work and work at the state and, and all of that is you, you, you do see familiar faces everywhere you go, often if you've been here long enough, but you, you absolutely see new people all the time and, um, and you see tourists and you see just um, a lot of different, you know, there's just a lot of change that happens with the, with the folks that are in town. And so that's what I appreciate. Put yourself in the, in the marketing of Montpelier. Marketing, yeah. The, the, the Business Development Corporation. Okay, yep. What are you marketing? If, if you had to do an elevator pitch. Yep. Um, and they said, you know, we're going to introduce you to a councilman. And yep. here's a councilman. Absolutely. What would you say in that short pitch? Well, what, what are the strengths that you would try and convey about our community? Well, there, there's a, there's a, thankfully, there's a lot to say. I believe that we, we, we are a tight-knit community, and I appreciate that. And, and um, you, you have an opportunity, no matter what your interest, to contribute to that community. And that's really, I think, important. We are a... a group of people that, that care, and it could be care about um, the, the corner of state in Maine, or it could be that you care about uh, climate change and everywhere in between, that we are a caring people that, that take action. And so if you come here, it's, it's a welcoming community, and if you, you are passionate and believe in something, you will find like-minded folks that may or may not disagree with you, but that are ready to take action and um, uh, and, and work for change, something that they believe in. And I think part of that is the, because we have the capital, there is this sense of a lot of the uh, people who are making change for the state are just a couple blocks down. And so if you, if, if you, if you believe in something, there's an opportunity to have a voice and to make change. Now, if I'm also, so th I think that that's important. I think also, um, if I were you know, giving my elevator speech, mm -hmm. this is more than an elevator speech at this point, but if I were talking about Montpelier, I would say it's, it's a place that offers economic opportunity, it's, it's welcoming, that there is a strong, a very strong connection between the people here and the natural environment. I do think it's something we can improve on, it's something I think a lot about that, um, that I would work towards, but we, we do have Dogger Fields and Hubbard Park and and um, and the, the recreation North, field and the, the pool and the the rec fields and the pool and the North Branch Nature Center right up the road and wilderness and 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 ski trails in the winter and mountain biking the the Sparrow Farm trails if you've had a chance to walk out there and the development that's happened over the past couple of years with more great things happening are a gem right outside our back door just and it's and it's nice and flat to get there and you can have a nice hike a, a bike a, a mountain bike in the summer and also in the winter so I, that's a big part of the lifestyle here in montpelier is this your first run for office uh it is it is now two questions yeah. how did you convince your wife 
<laughs> to let you run for council, given that it's not only Wednesday nights, it's a commitment to sitting on committees, <clears throat> yeah. it's a commitment to studying yeah. for Wednesday night. Yeah. Yeah. How did you arrive at the decision <laughs> to run for council? Well, I, pre I appreciate that question because it's, it's important. The bottom line is I and we, my wife and I, we love this city. I mean, we are here for the long term. You know, our kids, like I said, we st aren't even out of middle school yet. We're, you know, and we don't plan on going anywhere until, well, who knows when. But we are, we're very committed to, to being here and to the future of this city. And we think about what that means to if our kids decided to stay and raise their families here. Um, my wife works for a local nonprofit. She's very engaged in the livability and river access projects that are happening in town. Um, so it wasn't an easy decision. There's no doubt about it. Yes, the time is a bit of a challenge. No one's getting rich on city council. <laughs> no, no one's getting rich. Um, and so it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was not necessarily an easy decision, but it was one that we both believed in and made sense for us. And we want to be able to give back. Um, you know, as you know, as you and I have talked about before, I've been involved in improving the community here could in Montpelier you, for a long time. Could you explain what you've done prior to running for council in terms of community improvement? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think the, the, the biggest project, and this is where you and I had a connection before, was around the new playground at Union Elementary. Um, I actually spearheaded a, another art project at the school the year before that. I don't. What would that have been? What we painted the, um, the, the guardrail at, right. at the drop-off. It was this horrific, crumbling concrete um, piece that, that was covered in graffiti. Skateboarders, that, <laughs> the skateboarding piece. Exactly, Th that was the first thing that greeted our kids every day and it drove me crazy. And so I, I connected with the then principal, um, Chris Hennessy at the school, um, talked to um, the, a couple teachers, some friends, you know, the art teacher, and we, we pulled together a group and created a design. And then over subsequent days, at art class, Christina Kane, who's still the art teacher there, we, the, the classes came out, we painted the design on the front, we repainted the back, and then we had every child paint a star on the top of it. And so that was, that was neat, and that was really my introduction to work at the school. So then in, uh, in 2018, I started, and I won't go too far back on the whole new, on the, uh, the playground project at Union, which really was a five-year project five years plus to get it from idea to execution, right? But in 2018, I started working with the district on finalizing that project. There had been a lot of work done, a lot of volunteer work, and I started working to um, pull together all the pieces, mo move the project to bid, and then get the contract signed. And then, and then the two other big things that, that come up are, um, one, if you'll remember in 2018, the district went through significant change. A new superintendent. Right, right, a new principal. A new principal at the school, right. and as far as this project is concerned, a new director of facilities. So all of those things were happening right at the time we were supposed to be finalizing the bid process. So I kind of kept, carried the water, as it were, moved through those transitions, and then and to, to get everything ready for construction. And then the other big piece that I worked on was all the logistics around getting the school ready to manage the construction, which the primary, primary piece was moving the playground to Park Avenue right outside the school. So working with public works and city and fire um, and bill, of course, and city council and about closing off and I should mention the, all the neighbors, and the, you know, we, that's where you and I were talking yeah, exactly. about this. Um, and As a District 2 resident. Exactly. And um, uh, so, so the school would be ready to start without a playground on the traditional spot, but using, ha making sure that Park Avenue was going to be an appropriate space for the kids. Now, if I remember correctly, yeah. this project actually opened on time. We opened on time, absolutely, despite... Uh, despite the site being a brownfield site, um, once, we, uh, once we got through the bid process and got the contract signed, we had a really col collabor collaborative process with uh, ECI who did the building. And la at the, the night before the start of school this past end of August, um, I got to go up with uh, the new principal and all the volunteers who had been through this process the whole time. Um, 
and cut the ribbon. And I don't know if you were there, but no, no, no. It, was, it was a really neat experience because there was easily a couple hundred people there. But we're finishing our remarks, and as we're talking, I'm watching, the kids are just pushing forward. It was like a rock concert. The kids are just coming up and they're getting up to the ribbon and we just looked at each other like, we just, we got to cut this ribbon and let them loose. And we cut it and the kids just filled the, um, uh, filled the playground and it was just a great moment. It's a great moment. Your youngest is in what grade? Third. Yep. Do you think that uh, your youngest will see uh, housing and saving pasture <laughs> <laughs> while in Main Street Middle School, <laughs> high school? Are, are, are you saying, like, will he be able to buy a new house when no, he's no. old enough? Is uh, it? What I'm saying is that's a project that seemingly forever, it was coming around the same time as the Transit Center yeah. first yeah. started. Yeah. Do you think that that will actually see I something? I do. I do. I hope so. And I know there's been a little bit of news lately about some conver restarted conversations. Um, I don't know how significant that news is. I mean, obviously, the, the parcel that VCFA sold off mm -hmm. has, um, uh, you know, sort of sparked that conversation. Uh, and I, I do hope that it's something that we can continue to move forward it's on. Piece, I would like to see it. It's a piece of trivia, but... Yeah. Um, now, what is the, the distillery, uh, Bar Hill? Yeah. What's the name of the, the drive? That Gin, Lane. Gin Lane. Gin Lane, yeah. Gin Lane actually is intended to be a road that goes straight up Sabin's Pasture. It was laid out oh, in such a way that. Yeah. that it can go across the street and yeah. actually be functional hmm. in Sabin's Pasture. That would be great. So that's, that's a piece of trivia. That is interesting. You know, one, one of the other neat things about that project <clears throat> that... I'm really looking forward to it. Obviously, it has already had a significantly positive impact on our community and how we come together and how it's used. Um, is is in the in in the near future, the city is working with them and a local nonprofit on establishing an access point to the river um, that Where? is sort of. Uh, just a little bit beyond the parking lot, kind of as you come in and you you come in. Head now we're talking the about the distillery, Bar Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, in there, and so I, I'm excited. If you know, if you went after they opened, and if you went out there on a warm summer or fall evening, you saw how busy it was and how many people mm -hmm. were outside. Um, so I'm excited that that access point will be you know available to people as well to to get now, down by the water. Now we've talked about your elevator speech to people who are interested in our community. Yeah. Put on your other face to people who other live face. in our community. What are the challenges that oh. you see coming up for us that you don't talk to the outsiders about, but they're things that concern you? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's a lot. One, one that certainly is top of mind to me um, is livability. Um, livability livabil meaning? Sorry, yeah, livability meaning um, that making sure our downtown is pedestrian friendly, that um, folks who visit or walk into town f feel safe and, and have access to our local businesses. I think that we, the more access we can provide to rivers and open space are, are important. I think we're really lacking in that and we have some opportunities in the near future to improve that process. Now, you know, I'm very mindful that, um, that with a, lot, with a lot of these decisions come tax implications and we have to be very careful about uh, and very deliberate in how we're making these decisions and the impact Could we become gated? Could our tax, I mean, our, right now Cheated. our collective school city tax rate is amongst the highest in the state. Yeah. Could we be forcing our poor residents out with our tax decisions? Well, I think we, 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 we have to be mindful of growth. We have to stimulate growth and sometimes that takes investment but yes as a taxpayer and as my bill changes every year I feel it I, you know I'm a small business owner I work on my own every I feel every change I, you know it, and I worry about every change and, and every year I worry am I still going to be able to stay here and so I, gated maybe you know metaphorically speaking uh, exactly. fairly strong but I but I yes I do worry about affordability in town, absolutely. What can council do on affordability on that question? Well, you know, I think, look, we certainly could build our housing stock and, and, and do we build the housing well, I mean, stock? Well, I mean, we're not going to build it ourselves, but we can focus on, on providing incentives and for development that provide, you know, si similar to the partnership with Downstreet um, and, and, and the transit center, looking for ways to create a diversity of housing stock 
downtown to, to make it more affordable. Um, and I do, you know, we also do need to uh, you know, invest in organizations like the MDC, the Montpelier Development Corp. We need to always be partnering with folks like Montpelier Live who are and working on filling some of these empty businesses, providing economic opportunities. Now, you've probably well. followed yeah. the calming study on Main Street Barry. And, I have, the, yeah. and the master downtown plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those went for recent hearings. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling on the calming study uh, that would start off at the light on the other side of the bridge and work its way all the way up to the library? Yep. Um, yep. And it would result, I suppose, in a traffic circle at the library and smart lights. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a great idea that speaks to that idea of livability. Certainly the area at the intersection with Barry Street where the, the, um, the, the new footbridge and bike path connect that would be at, a light. The, at the Moat lot. That would, be, that, would be, that would be a light, yes? Uh, the Moat lot being what? Where the old, the beverage center was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that's one of the decisions I alluded to that the council is, need to be, is going to have to decide in the Do you near think future. there'll be, um, uh, over at the uh, drawing board uh -huh. next to it, the Moat, the Moat yep. Trust, was offered that piece of land and uh, ultimately they decided against it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that will ultimately end up a cap building the size of the other buildings or green space? I mean, it's not my decision to make, but well, I, on I, console, I, it certainly it, would it, be, it'd be part of the conversation. <laughs> I ultimately, I. Like I said, I think it's important that we're looking at development downtown and and promoting businesses. But I also see that lot as a very rare opportunity to establish some green space in town. Of course, we've got to be cognizant of the of the implications to parking behind the building, right? But with the Confluence Park on the other side of the footbridge, and then and then having more green space there, that would. I feel that would bring a great deal of value to that space. So I wouldn't prescribe that, yes, this will happen or no, it won't happen. But I do think we need to find a balance in that area. While we're in Confluence Park, yeah. we're very close mm -hmm. to the Phantom Parking Garage. To the Phantom Parking Garage, yeah. And, and I, should, I should mention, full disclosure too, um, my wife is the project manager for Vermont River Conservancy working on the Confluence Park. So you've probably seen her at city council meetings, testifying, and she's been managing the design process and, and all of that. So just um, full was disclosure. There any, was there any way that you could see of avoiding that fight, of avoiding the, was there a way yeah. that you could square that, that circle? Square that circle. Well, I'll say this. One of the biggest lessons that I learned doing the, working on the playground project was that, this was on behalf of the district at this point, but was that, I feel that the district, or the city in this case, has to be proactive in communicating to the community around what the implications of the project are. The scope, the implications, et cetera. Now I know the city did, did everything they needed to in terms of warning meetings and maintaining an appropriate process, and that was great, but I one of the things that I think I would, I know that I would bring to the council in my experience with the playground is a sense of urgency around being proactive in communication um, about the implication. I think a lot of people, even though they had opportunities to go to meetings, still felt caught off guard when it came to voting for the bond. They didn't have, and it, and it turned into a lot of conversations and a very, a very divisive conversations around either you're for it or you're against it. And it didn't have to be that. I think you, at a minimum, you need to provide opportunity for people to understand what's going on and speak up if they'd like. Now, does that mean we wouldn't be in the legal situation we are now with, with the... Um, Adversarial waiting for the environmental court in, exactly. in, in and, May. Exactly, in May and all of that. I don't know if that would have changed anything. But I do know that it could have been a project that the community could have rallied around. And and had a more collaborative experience around the development of it. And I would love to see that happen in the future because that 
feed while we were always you know hearing input and some feedback here and there around the playground the, the that piece of it the communication was always very collaborative with our neighbors and with with parents so they understood what the disruption would be it's not perfect you're always going to have people who um, have issues or complaints and that's fine but that's part of the process you hear that and then you figure out ways to adapt the project to make it as accommodating as you can now you would be replacing a city council person uh, and Glenn Hutchison, uh -huh. who's most noteworthy for his weekly meetings. Yeah. For yeah. reaching out to the community and, yeah. and listening to the community. Yeah. You have a background in communications, don't you? I do. You? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I um, have... Uh, I've had a number of positions locally in communications. I've run the, uh, many years ago, I ran the marketing and communications office at Norwich University. Um, more recently, I ran the marketing and communications office up at VCFA. Um, that was a few years ago still. Uh, and I still do some, some consulting on it as well as the photography and, and filmmaking. So, yeah. How would you see... Last year, I believe, Council made it a priority to improve communications. Yeah. I think that was one of their stated priorities that they came out of their annual mm -hmm. session with uh, after town meeting day. Yeah. Is there anything that you could see that you would handle differently if you were on Council in terms of communicating message? Now, do you mean in terms of specific actions or just, just, just in general? Just in general. Have, have you thought about, you know, obviously you've thought about communication yeah. because you were yeah. on the front line of that. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I still, even though I think that the council has improved and there are, there's a number of projects moving forward, I do still think there's opportunities to communicate better around them. And you, I think it's important to, to, to recognize that a lot of you know, citizens, we're busy, we're, we're working, we're raising families, we're doing everything we can. Sometimes the information has to uh, be put in front of you. And so, you know, when we were dealing with the playground, we were knocking on doors. It wasn't just me. Chris Hennessy was printing flyers and running to neighbors and putting them, uh, running around the neighborhood, putting them in their mailboxes. Now, is that something the council will do? I don't know if that's appropriate necessarily, but it's that level of engagement that then brought those neighbors to the school to talk about the project, what it would mean to them, access to their driveways, et cetera. We learned about what they were concerned about because we had um, property owners who had tenants, we had people who were living in the homes, and we were able to accommodate them. Not that you can always do that, but I do think that at some level, it needs to go beyond a post to, um, to the city website and then social media channels, because even though maybe it feels like it, but not everybody is on Facebook. It feels like all of Montpelier gets front porch forum, but not everybody reads it every day the three or four times a day that we get it. A lot of people do, and that's great, but I do think we need to look at other channels to be able to get information out. You know, and a perfect example of that right now is the rec center. You know? Awesome. Well, I just think that that is something, something that concerns the city, because it's something that will Well, be, ultimately, it's something that's going up, up for a large box. That's what I mean. That mm -hmm. it involves all of us, but then also when you think about construction and the implication of the residential areas right in that area, then I think that that's, that is an example where it's, it's not just enough to be posting to these electronic channels. We need to be, and, or, or dedicating an ad space or something in, in the papers. But we do need to think about uh, a broader effort so people understand the, the choices that are mm -hmm. out there with the two, the two or two and a half versions that are there and what the tax implications are. Um, I talked about the council retreat that happens after town meeting day. Mm -hmm. yep. Should you win the seat, you're mm -hmm. going to have a seat at that council yeah. retreat, and basically they will ask you, Jay, what are your interests? What, what you committee think? would you like to sit in yeah. on? What, what would you like to represent? What outside organization or, or council committee would you want to sit in, if you had your druthers? If I had my druthers, um, you know, I don't have a specific one. I, I, I come back to that idea of, of livability and access and working, you know, access to our natural resources. So a focus on that and collaborating with the Parks Department, um, looking at economic development in town and in downtown and also in, in our neighborhoods. That's really where I, my focus would be. Is there any one issue that you would like to tackle in 2020 on console? I mean, really grab, a, as, as Donna has tackled um, transportation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
No, there, there's not one specific one. I, you know, I appreciate Ann has, Ann talks a lot about um, our long-term environmental impact and right, environmental right. goals. Don has talked about transportation. Um, I, I, outside of this sort of the, this livability idea and, and maintaining an affordable city um, and be, the, the, the council being able to engage and communicate better with people, I think that that's where my focus is. When we talk about people, mm -hmm. what about the homeless issue? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly uh, a key issue that, that the city's with dealing panhandling. with. Uh, of course. And I do appreciate that, that we've allocated the, the funds, the 45000 in the in the budget. Um, it is something that we, we need to deal with. But homelessness certainly is not unique to Montpelier by any means. Um, so I do think we need to look at it systemically. We need to collaborate with the towns that are around us and understand how they're dealing with it um, and, and think about a, a, a more, I guess I'll call it a more global perspective, um, but just really focusing on an area and how can we manage it. For as many people who are homeless, there are that many reasons why they're homeless. No one, there's no silver bullet that says, oh, if we could do this, then everybody... No. So you support the licensed social worker? In uh, absolutely. In yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's developing relationships with the people, trying to be empathetic, meeting them where they're at and understanding what their needs are. Because like I said, for everyone, it's, it's a different, um, uh, there's a different reason. So it, it's challenging because we don't have unlimited resources. We're a compassionate city and we want to be welcoming to everyone. But um, we, we do need to, to engage, and so yes, that the social worker position I think is a great step. Jay, this is the end of our time. Thank you so very much for coming and visiting. It's my pleasure, Richard. I, Thanks I for having me. Great to see you again. And I want to thank you for watching this show tonight. And again, as I said at the beginning of the show, and as I say at the end of all of these, please watch them all. They're all worth watching. Even if you're in District 3, watch the ones with Connor and, <laughs> and with Donna. And the school board members, those are really fascinating shows where we really dive into the policy of our school and basically what is going on with our school. Because as Jay said, you can never communicate enough in terms of, of what is going on in town. I would urge you to watch the school board meetings and the city council meetings on ORCA. But most important, show up at City Hall on town meeting day and get out and vote. Because voting is the bedrock of our democracy and it's important and make sure the family and friends do same. Thank you very much.